Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 lawyers over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My mission is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, is doing during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how lawyers have, are, and will be coping with our multiple crises, the global pandemic, Brexit, and of course, the ongoing and accelerating collapsing of capitalism, the state, and the climate through this decade. To do this, I need people, people like you, dear listener. Most of all, I need people who are in Leeds or who are from Leeds to come on this show and be my guests. So please join me and help me with this mission whenever and however you can. Critically, I will need people like you, dear listener, as financial backers. Please consider supporting or donating to this project. You can do so with a £1 monthly donation via either Patreon or Ko-fi, or you could donate any one-off amount to working hours via either Ko-fi or through the Libra Pay button on the About page of Western Studios' website. Thank you. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I don't think I, I didn't have a sense of wanting to be anything. I think I took it for granted I was going to be a professional cricketer because I was absolutely fanatical about cricket for some reason. And yeah, so I, I lived for cricket. I could, you know, I knew how much, you know, Len, Hunt, Len Hutton had scored at Headingley in, you know, July 1964. Or, you know, I, I was completely into it from about the age of seven till about the age of 14 or 15, I thought, well, yeah, this is what I'm meant to do. And I was sort of, you know, a fast bowler and I got people out and then suddenly something changed. And that was that, that was cricket left behind. I mean, I'll still, I'll still watch the highlights of the test match tonight. Of course, I, mm. I was going to say, are you still interested in it or it just totally died out? Or... No, no, I love it. I love it. And in fact, I've got, my friend has got a ticket for me on Sunday morning. So I'm going to go, if, if, if it lasts that long, because uh, heading me, anybody who knows cricket knows that it can be over within about two days. <laughs> heading. But um, no, I shall go. I, I still love it, but I, I can't play anymore. And yeah. my knees are too cronky. You're listening to Series 3, Episode 29, and to my guest, Peter Spafford. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 24th of June, 2022. Hello, loves. Peter Spafford has written for theatre, radio, musical theatre, TV and opera. His plays have been performed in theatres, cathedrals, museums, art centres, day centres, prisons, schools, piazzas and in the woods. Peter is currently director of words at Chapel FM Art Centre. He is also a songwriter and musician, having just produced Unsung Sports, a project celebrating lesser known sports in the city. You can go and have a look at unsungsports.com to find out more about that. But now, please enjoy this episode of Working Hours with Peter Spafford. Okay, so what is it that you do now then? I'm a writer, what I say I am and what I do, uh, but I, there are all sorts of aspects of, of that. I also work as a musician and songwriter mm -hmm. and, a, and a broadcaster as well with, with Chapel FM Arts Centre, East Leeds FM. But uh, broadly speaking, I'm a writer, Simon, and uh, yeah, so I've, I write plays and poetry and lyrics and I, I kind of everything, I, and I do lots of workshops, I do... Uh, kind of residences in places like prisons or schools or mm. hospitals and so everything is encompassed for me in that in that word so however it's still i still feel a bit pretentious saying i'm a writer mm. but and that's after many many years doing it because mm. it does sound a bit poncy but oh, it's the only word i've found that kind of takes in the range of stuff that i do because i'm a bit of a flippity gibbet and i like doing lots and lots of different kinds of stuff but mm. most of it is with people. I love mm. to be on my own writing, but I also, a lot of my work is about work, uh, writing with people or sort of, yeah, facilitating, easing people into that, a part of themselves, perhaps that they hadn't expected to find, hadn't expected to do, and but enjoy doing. Mm. So how did you get into it? Well, I, 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 I was good at the, when, the other thing I did Apart from playing for <laughs> one, 
kid was sort of acting and you know it's that thing of I was in a school play or two and people say oh you're very good at that and so I thought well yeah I've done maybe maybe I'm that then yeah uh, so I I I off the university I applied for a, a post-grad acting course and uh, got in there but then in the sort of um, my, I came back from traveling after, just after university. My dad had died. I was in a very, in a state of flux. I didn't know where I was going. I thought, well, I'll, I need, I need an equity card to, to, to mm. act because in those days you do, I don't know you did. So I, I hitched around, uh, the Midlands in the North of England, looking for jobs as, as a stagehand. I got a job as a stagehand at the Birmingham Rep, my first theater job. And, and then I got a job with a political theater company as there were lots of them at that time. Um, I'm sure there still are, but they, it felt like a very fertile time for political theater. And I got involved in one of those. And of course, you know, go to drama school, nah, bourgeois. And you know, why would you want to do that? So, and also I, I saw, I grew to hate it kind of with a vengeance, of course, because, you know, emotions were very strong at that time, you know theater that had a stage and costumes I mm. would do theater that had no lights costumes anything that's just done in a in a, mm. in a village hall or a, you know in the street so I, I didn't go to drama school and then I realized that I did a bit of acting after that but I realized I got into writing with the theater company and mm. a few scenes here and there and I realized that you have far more agency over your life as a writer than as an actor you can do you can write anywhere you know in a cafe you can just, you know, in a, on a park bench and, and, but you can't do Hamlet, you know, mm. on a park bench with yourself. Mm. It, it would look a bit strange. I'm sure someone's done it though. <laughs> I'm sure they have. Well, they need to anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of transition from wanting to be an actor into being a writer. I mean, like as a performer, were you quite into sort of the, were you quite into improv and things like that? If you were wanting to kind of break away from theatre, like staging and texts and so on. I would imagine that was kind of that that's my immediate thought of like, oh, I like improvising with the character. Oh, I like developing this character. Oh, I actually like writing the character. That's how I imagine it. Was it similar to that? Very yeah. Very much like that, actually. I was with a theatre company that that in, we went into a space with an audience and we had nothing. We had no script. Mm. We made up the, we had a technique of eliciting the the story from the audience and we acted out that story with them it was a fantastic theatre company called Word and Action and they toured all over the place we toured Europe and, and doing this kind of work and yeah it was all about improvisation it was very scary you know I mean the first one I went to the first the first gig I got with them was with some girl guides you know mm. in, a, in Dorset somewhere and there are about 100 of them and we had to make up a story from it <laughs> it was absolutely it was it was horrifying, but no, I was, and I, but it was it was it was it was great actually. And and after that, we did do a bit of script writing too. We did scripted pieces, and through that, I started writing scenes and and yeah, developing characters. I've always been interested in, in more in story, I think, than character, which mm -hmm. is why I don't write novels or because I think novels are very much about character rather than story. But yeah, yeah, I mean that's but basically through improvisation, that was that was the kind of political part of that theatre company. Mm. We're not going in with a script. We're not going in as actors. We mm. are going in as human beings into this space. There is a story here in this in this room. Mm. We're going to draw it out and then we're going to act it out together. It was a very beautiful thing actually. Mm. As a writer now then your your working day I mean, are you one of those sort of, do you get up every day, same hour, go down to the shed or whatever and do, you know, however many thousand words, like, how do you work it? Like how much time is spent getting involved in new projects? Because obviously a lot of your work's theater based and you're doing a lot of kind of the radio stuff. So I would imagine there's a lot of meetings and a lot of like looking for work as well as, you know, so it's not just get up, write words, send it to someone. And spot on some, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think it's, I'm always interested how as human beings, we always find excuses not to do the thing that we really need or want to do most in our lives. And, you know, this morning I thought, I really want to write, but I had a piece of writing I really wanted to do. Did I do it? Of course I didn't. You know, I found 
which reasons not to do it. It's strange <laughs> because actually it would make me feel better. And at the moment, I really need to do some writing and, and, I, and I, I need to do that kind of for my own health, I think. Mm. Uh, I get a bit twitchy if I don't. Mm. That's just me writing. That's why I write poetry. I love poetry because it's just me and that poem. Nobody's going to come in. Mm. I, don't have to, I don't have to compromise in any way. I don't have to discuss it. There's no negotiation. Mm. That's it. However, I haven't done it this morning. I've, I'm here with you, which is very lovely, but also, you know, I, I answer the emails because there is a lot, as you say, there's a lot of that stuff to do. There's mm. setting up projects, there's kind of, you know, I've got to write a report for the Arts Council about a project. I've got to, you know, set up a, some stuff for next week, a meeting, do some research for some, it's always masses of stuff to do. And I, as a self-employed person and, and a self-employed artist, I think many, if anybody's listening who is they will know what i mean it's it's you know you could be doing three or four projects in a day or mm -hmm. you know nibbling into those projects and you have mm -hmm. your head has to split all the time talking to matthew bell with a colleague of mine the other day and he was like, i just would love to do one thing mm -hmm. four days uh and and, I, and yeah last last year i went I, I went on a i got a residency with the britain Pairs Foundation in they they lend out houses uh, in, in Suffolk where Benjamin Britain used to live with Peter Pears, 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 Pears I'm sorry I always say Pears Pears, Pears is so and um, yeah and I had a, 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 a week on my own uh, writing and it's, it was absolute bliss have I made space in my life to do that since mm. of course I haven't and I could you know I could but I don't so I I need to someone I need. I need to do it. <laughs> do you do you have a space then? Do you like do you work in a particular space? Have you got an office in the house or? Yes, I've got an office in the house. It's a really lovely place uh, to work. But on the other hand, uh, again, I think a lot of writers write better, more fluently when they're not in the space they're usually in. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I go off for the day somewhere, you know, uh, just by myself, some mm -hmm. of these ideas start flowing. It's almost like I've cut the tethers of, you know, the emails I have to do, the only thing. Yeah. Like, and it these all and it, into this vacant space flows idea flow ideas you know and i'm thinking this is this one but that's paradoxical it's weird mm. isn't it you know you've mm. a really nice place to work the sun's there's trees outside mm. you know i've got a desk and yet somehow the, the familiarity the domesticity of it mm. uh, militates against against a creativity i mean i do some writing here i do writing but but i i'm much better if i'm removed from it if i remove from it when I really start to have ideas. I don't know what that's about, but I think mm. uh, it's like David Peace writing much better about Britain when he's in Japan, you know, or something. I mean, it's, it's, the same, it's the same kind of thing, but yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah, you need that sort of distance. I mean, it depends on the person as well, because everyone does those kind of things in different ways. I mean, do you get the feeling that, do you think you could reach a point of kind of consistent output and and being creative like i see it very much as like creative process as human processes as, as or natural processes being like very much ebb and flow but the system wants us to be very much robotic like stop and go so when it's switched on it runs and it runs at that rate or it speeds up if you need it to speed up but it never stops it never needs to take time off and chill out and decompress and like you know look at a nice view <laughs> Yes, I think that's really interesting. I, I think, and I, I think we see that in the way in what we expect from established artists. You could call them mm. you know, recording artists. You, they have to make what well, in the old days used to make an album every year or mm. every two years, and it has to be the same standard, and it has to be twelve songs on the old album, you know, before mm. CDs. And that's a lot, mm. you know, that's, that's over five albums. That's, that's 60 songs, mm. 60 or 70 songs, and they need to be sick. And I, I just think that's not how art works as you say it's very much about ebb and flow it's about tension and release it's about fallow and work you know and i think certainly i work like that and i and i sometimes i really want to write poetry and i do that and i don't for a couple of years sometimes sometimes i really want to write i'm doing a lot of drawing and some painting and, and mm. hustling at the moment i've got into that i do that for a two months intensively that's where it all goes that's what my you know, it's what my, something in, in me says I'm doing and then I leave it. So yes, it's, it's a sort of whimsical process. And so, yeah, I, I, I think though, to answer your question that uh, for me, a two week period of, of intense writing, nothing else going on, 
Mm-hmm. I'd be fine with that. And then I'd go, I really want to be with people again. I can't mm-hmm. be, I can't be. I, it, after a little while, I feel like I'm a can I'm cannibalizing myself and I'm kind of tearing strips off my own shoulder to eat. And mm-hmm. it's kind of, I, I need to feed off other people. And I, a lot, and substantially with my writing anyway, a lot of writers write from, or well, some writers write from about their own experience. I generally don't. Mm. I'm much more interested in other people. I find much other people much more interesting mm. than me. So I, I need to be with people. And I love the kind of writing that is about listening to people, taking something from what they've done and then writing about it. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, um, give me give me a couple of weeks. Uh, it's like Henry Raby the other day was saying about give me some more money and a piece of give me some money and a piece of, <laughs> and some stuff, piece of, of of open space and and some time and I'll and I'll produce. No, I mean it's it's you know, I, I'm being facetious really, but it would be lovely to have <laughs> time. But on the other hand, mm. I know that it's a dialectic. It's a constant swing for me between mm. being on my own writing and with other people listening. So I'm going to go through COVID now then first. So we'll go back. I like to go back and sort of take you into like basically make you think of the week before or whatever of, and also at what point you locked down. I mean, there's the the sort of official lockdown, but things were happening before. Like what happened for you in that process? What did lockdown sort of change? You were in like loads more initially when you were locked down or did it drop off? Like how was that process for you and how has COVID changed your work sort of as you work now? Well, that's a really, that's, that's a big question and a very interesting. Mm. I, 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 I think a lot of people, uh, start, started with this, oh, here's this time. What am I doing? There's, there's nothing happening. I'm, this is an opportunity. Some, so something in me rose to that. I thought, mm. well, this is crew, this is concentrated time to do some writing. Mm. I've been trying for a while to write about my practice, my being the kind of writer I am, which is a writer in communities. I've done a lot of work over, over the last God knows how many years doing that. And I don't think there's enough anecdotal writing from writers who the kind of writers that, that I know who I am, kind of writer I am, about that work. I mean, there's lots of Arts Council reports and there's, 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 there's various academic sort of bits and pieces, but, and journals. But, you know, for, the, for, for, for sort of somebody who knows nothing about the kind of work I do, which is working mm. on Chapel FM in Seacroft or in prison or in school, I thought, that's, I thought this is the moment to be doing this. So for, for in the first two weeks of lockdown, I wrote something like, like 50,000 words. I mean, it was ridiculous. Mm. Just went at it. And then I did that thing of, which I mentioned, of feeling I was just sort of consuming myself and mm. a bit sick, so I'm not going to do that anymore. And I left it. Mm. But then something else happened was, which was the Chapel FM, East Leeds FM, where I work, we got a license from Ofcom. We were only one of, we're one of the only community radio stations in the country, only three, I think, who got an emergency license to broadcast on FM for a hyper local audience. So usually we're on the internet at East Leeds FM, which when we broadcast from Chapel FM, but we do have a mast for FM. So suddenly uh, we got permission to do that. And we were broadcasting for three hours a day, every day to the local, very local audience in East Leeds. And it was that we were broadcasting for people mainly who didn't have the internet because I think there was mm. an option during COVID that we were all connected, that we were all, we could all go on Facebook and, you know, talk about whatever it was, compare photographs of us mm. on the age, age 20 or the, the baking we were doing. And, but a lot of people couldn't because they, they weren't connected and aren't connected. Mm. So we were broadcasting to those people. We had Elliot, a oh, lovely guy who works with us. And he was going out every morning to Tesco and he was, he had something called the shopping forecast where, you know, he would go in, <laughs> oh, this toilet roll in Tesco, the recent flower in Aldi, you know, and that was really useful. And mm. I hoped it was, I was, and for that, I was producing, I was soliciting writing from writers in Yorkshire. I was doing about 20 mm. minutes of, of broadcasting a day of, of, and writers. Mm hundred writers sent in stuff, which I edited and put in a little feature every day for those uh, probably about three or four months. So that was very mm-hmm. occupying and it felt important. And I think the thing I think for a lot of people during lockdown was who am I, what am I, what am I for? You know, 
because I'm not at the office. I'm not working. I'm not, you know, unless I'm, unless I'm on the front line. And I know those people must have felt incredibly useful and also exhausted. But for a lot of mm-hmm. people, I think, well, what the hell was that? And now I'm this. And, you know, where does it go from here? Who am I? Mm-hmm. I avoided some of that because we were so busy mm-hmm. producing that broadcast every day. Um, and then I had an idea of my own at the Leeds Inspired Blessing, where, which is part of the Leeds uh, City Council, the art, kind of arts arm of that city of the council, they, they were giving out some emergency grants. So I applied to do a project and my project was, I've been writing for years and poet, poem portraits, which are, I sit with somebody for say half an hour, 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I listen to them and then I write a poem for them, about them. It's a kind of portrait of them in words at that particular moment. Sometimes I do it with a photographer, Lizzie Coon, mm-hmm. with a photograph and a poem. And I've wanted to do, because I write songs, I've been wanting to do for years a sort of a, a series of song portraits. So you listen mm-hmm. to somebody, same process, and then you write a song for them. So I thought, what about that? But do a short amount, a small amount of these, but do them on the phone, maybe with older people who aren't connected. It, will that work? So I applied for the money, got it. And I did nine uh, song portraits of older people in Leeds. I worked with local organizations to find those older people who wanted to be part of it. And I found that immensely satisfying. I did everything. I produced everything and performed everything and produced everything on Garage Band. Mm. In, that in my house, you know, I wrote the songs from conversations I had with those people on the phone, mm. long conversations, which are lovely conversations. And I'm still in touch with some of those people. And they were absolutely, they were so positive about being, you know, despite being isolated, mm. but yeah, I, I found it very, it, it kept me going. Mm. I felt I was doing something for them. And then the songs went out and people listened to them. And that was very pleasing as well. Uh, and yeah, so they were, there was a series of, there was a series of nine song portraits and, uh, which I very much enjoyed doing and, and I learned a lot from doing and yeah, so I, I kind of, the COVID, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of an important time f- for me in that respect, I, because it galvanized me to some mm. degree. I was lucky. I was lucky. I was here with my partner and my son, who was 18 at the time, 17, and we, he would have been off somewhere if it, mm. it hadn't been for COVID. We had a very precious time. The three of us, our other son was away and I was doing this work, which I felt, <laughs> I felt was useful. I'm not sure how useful it was in the, in the, you know, in terms of when you compare it to frontline workers, but it was a kind of, it was a kind of usefulness that I, I that I aspired to and, and, and yeah, so that, that, that's what I was up to for certainly for the first six months on it. Mm. I mean, it sounds like there's a couple of things in there. So I think control of your work, I think, is one. And then, like, I was going to say that. No, it's gone. But uh, I mean, I think it's interesting in that. Oh, that was the other thing. So, yeah, people sort of, you saying people questioning what they're doing. But it sounds like there wasn't really any kind of questioning of what you were doing or, or like maybe some of why you're doing it. But it's kind of like, it seems to me, that's more of a, how do I keep doing what I'm doing rather than why have I been doing this? So yeah. And in terms of control, like having moving towards writing and with those projects, it's like, cause you were describing then with the songs, like how you were doing everything yourself and that kind of like, I recognize some of that in myself of just being able to have complete control of the work and like do this thing the way you want it done. And it's like, It'll be good or bad, but at least there's only me to blame for it. It's like, yeah, I think that's interesting that those are, those are items that come up. Well, you say, yes, as in your, when you, at the opening of your podcast, you say, I'm only, it's only me to blame for this. There's something, <laughs> there's something about that. Yeah. And I, I think maybe that was part of it for, with COVID for me was everything felt out of control. Mm. Thing, everything felt a sway and a kilter, you know, off kilter, I should say. But the song portraits was something I could do. It was a simple process. You phone somebody up, mm. they talk to you, <clears throat> you take something away, you phone them again and say, this is what I've got. Is it okay? Here's a song. Mm. It, it, it was a, it, in a way, a, it was a complex process and because it was about listening and, and doing justice to that. Mm. It's to get it right. But it, in some ways it was a terribly simple process and it, it processed and it, the fact that I, as, as we were saying that I could 
but perform the songs, record them, produce them myself mm. and give them over in the CD form because <laughs> they play CDs rather than download anything was, was, yeah, it was pleasing. It felt, it felt within something that mm. the remix, something I could do. Yeah. Mm. For myself with other people. Mm. But I mean, that's nice as well. Like being able to give them a physical format at the end, like you say, it's not just a download. It's a, here's something actually physical and real that I made and that you made with me and here's a record of it. I think that's really nice. So, well, do you so think... I call it... sorry, go on. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to say also part of me was part of it for me was cycle. I used to cycle to as far as I, I could. I'm not a great cyclist, but I thought I'm going to try and do that thing of just be a bit greener. So I thought I would cycle to each person. So I actually went to where they lived with the CD in my hand mm. and I, and I handed it over to them and said, listen to this. And if there's anything you don't like about it, it's if something doesn't sit right for you, mm. tell I'll change it. And they did, mm. uh, which was fantastic. Uh, but it felt like a very physical process. Yeah. And that, and that was also satisfying. Mm. And you're connecting with people in person as well there as well, you know, not through a screen. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this makes things easier doing it through a screen at this, you know, cause there's not travel to a place. And I think, yeah, that's why I'm still doing it, but I am missing being able to sort of do these face to face. So I'm probably going to start going back to it a bit more anyway. So I'll move on a little bit, but we'll go back to uh, with COVID. I mean, how do you think it's changed your work? Has everything back to normal now, or are you like, it hasn't, it hasn't altered the way I approach my work really, to be honest with you, it, the, the technology side has changed and I now do some stuff on zoom, That that's, that's about it, but it's no, I mean, I'm. I think there's a hunger to get back into face-to-face -face stuff, be in the same room as other people. I have a writing group at Chapel FM every Wednesday. It's, it's, it's um, a mixed group, mixed ages, and some people are in the room, some people are on the screen. So we have about five or six people joining online, some and five or six people in the room. I thought now that's going to be really tricky in terms of focus, of my focus. You know, the screen up there, the people here, I was a bit worried about that, but actually, do you know, it was, it's really nice. Mm. I've, I've really enjoyed that because it suits the people, those people who join online, they, for various reasons, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to make the group at all if it was mm. like we expected them to come in person. Mm. So it's great that they're there at all. And somehow it's really, we're very adaptive, I think, as human beings. I mean, it's extraordinary how we do adapt to all kinds of stuff mm. and awful and good. But I think, uh, yeah, we have adapted in all kinds of ways. And I, I certainly, for me and my work with people in a writing group, producing writing, sharing writing, the online thing, the online option is great. And I, and I, during Again, during lockdown, we did a lot of work at Chapel FM with young people. I had a writing group there of young, young people and, and, you know, a woman, a young woman was joining from Moscow, you know, and somebody was from Lithuania. It was, <clears throat> it was lovely, you know, it was, it was so it, it, yeah. And, and of course that person, she's not joining now, sadly, because of the war, I think, um, um, that's a, that's a sadness, but you know, she could join us on a Wednesday afternoon. Mm from Moscow and she would be very welcome. And of course there are people who've just nipped down the road from Seacroft and they're in the room with me. No, I still, I, I don't think it's altered fundamentally and profoundly what I do. I mm. think it's just made me a bit more conscious. And I'm sure it's true with a lot of people of the fragility of what we have, you know, and I think, you know, how the pandemic could suddenly deprive of, deprive us of all kinds of things that we've taken for granted. And I think that's, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying the pandemic was a good thing, but I think that anything that makes us that appreciate the fragility, the preciousness of, of the things that we value is quite good in, in the longer run. If, if we really reflect on that and act on that. Mm. Yeah. But a lot of the time that's having the time and the space to do that, isn't it? Of course, which we, we got with COVID. Some of us got with, COVID. but then, <laughs> but then for prolonged periods of when you're not doing anything, you're kind of like, well, I can't make any plans because I don't know what's going to happen next. Like I've got this thing that like COVID made time collapse 
gaps for so many people. It's just like, I don't know when things happened or was that this year? Was that last year? What the hell's going on? I don't know anymore. That's right. No, absolutely. It's extraordinary. Uh, so um, we'll stay in the the kind of bleaker questions for the moment because the, 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 the Brexit question, I haven't had a happy answer yet, so I'm hoping <laughs> one day I'll come across one. But in terms of Brexit, have you noticed any change in your work? Has it changed anything for you at all? Well, that's interesting. But I basically, as a result of Brexit and how I felt about that, perhaps not surprisingly, I, I wanted to do something that counteracted that something again it comes back to control so i the whole thing of what can i do here i mm. these this is now completely outside of my control i you know i vote and i voted to remain but but that that, that so we've left what can i do so i i i thought I'm, i want to i want to create contacts and and communities across borders mm. i've always wanted to do that i've always enjoyed to do, do doing that but i want to do that very much now mm -hmm. and i'm going to make that happen so i went to the international department of, of lee city council and talked to them about the cities that we are twinned with lille bruno in czech republic and dortmund in germany and i thought right that's a place to start so mm. i thought i'm gonna, I'm gonna so i called this thing writers in transit and i wrote to writers in bruno i wrote to writers in lille and i wrote to writers in 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 dortmund there was one writer in dortmund who who responded really really positively ralph tenio and he said yes i do a lot of this international work i go to georgia in the you know in the by the black sea and i do work i'd love to do this so we the lee city council gave us a bit of money he came over i went over there and then it turned out that the next following year was the 50th anniversary of the twinning of Leeds and Dortmund. And of course, you know, there's Dortmund Square in Leeds mm -hmm. with the, the Drayman uh, statue, which is in Dortmund and his twin brother is in Leeds, mm -hmm. which is a different. And so, you know, we did interviews down there. We, we had, well, uh, we created a children's book uh, with Beechwood Primary School. It was in German and English. And I set up uh, a, a visit to a school in Dortmund. I was going over there with two writers and a photographer. Everything was going to happen. That was May 2020. And of course, we know what happened, <laughs> but so in a sense, has Brexit changed anything? I do. Well, this is a positive answer. I, it, it, again, it galvanized me to, to, to do that. And I'm really pleased with it. And, and, and we did they eventually, it actually was just before COVID in 2019, we did 25 events in Leeds around Chapel FM and other places, the Leeds library involving Dortmund and German writers and sort of celebration of Leeds and Dortmund and including a fantastic gig. I have to say this with a, a Chapel FM, which was this Chapel FM jazz collective. They adapted a miners hymn from the Ruhrpott uh, and they made it into a sort of African township piece. And they did some, they did some jazz versions of jazz funk versions of Kraftwerk songs. And it was just the most amazing gig. And the mayor of Dortmund was there. It was, and he, and he loved it. So I'm now renewing those contacts with Dortmund. And just this week, in fact, I've had an email from somebody called Calvin. He's a poet in Dortmund saying, we would like to bring two young Leeds artists over in 2023. And so this pleases me. And I think, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I get, I subscribe to a fantastic paper called The New European. It comes out every week there. The, the cover this week is five, you know, six years since, since the vote. Uh, and these are the things that we have gained from Brexit. And of course the whole front page is just blank. So I, I feel very pessimistic and angry about all that still, but I, I kind of believe in making something from it, making something of it. And I, and I feel that I feel I'm trying to do that with the Leeds Dortmund connection. What can you do in your work? What do you do in your work? Can you do anything in your work in terms of adaptation, mitigation, awareness raising, like what can you do to actually do something about climate change. Ooh. Yeah, you definitely do small talk on this on this podcast. Don't you? Brexit. <laughs> the environment. I'm not sure. I I I I'm I I'm not I mean I'm I'm I've gradually moved to be more vegetarian than my son who's he only ate sausages till the age of sixteen. And then suddenly he he was a, he went out with a vegan and now he's a very vegetarian and almost a vegan. So I've, I've gone that way and, and 
that something may be. I, I, I'm, I, you know, I talked about cycling CDs to mm-hmm. in some portraits. That felt that felt as if I had some agency. Most of the, and I'm, I'm contemplating getting, you know, a hybrid electric car when my ten year old go mm-hmm. Fabia die. Beyond that, Simon, I'm not sure what I uh, what I am doing. I'm sure I could do more. Oh, I tell you what, we are doing we're replacing some windows. Uh, to, we've got had old Victorian windows, you know, mm. in the old 1890s. That's going to make a difference. I'm, these things I tell myself. It's like, mm. kind of, I think we have to keep doing that because we tell ourselves a story because that in sort of charges us up to do more, maybe. Mm. But and I don't feel completely useless and powerless. But yeah, I, a part of me feels I just think we need. There's a, there's a, I forget his name now, but he's a, he's a, he's a, I think he's a Swedish writer. Uh, Andreas Malm, I think his name is, I don't know if you know about him, but he talks about the necessity to introduce a kind of war communism. He, 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 he talks about war, war communism was what Lenin brought in to, in order for the Soviet Union to survive. Mm. It was an absolutely rigorous, uh, strip down of the economy with very, very, very strict rules. That was, you know, in 1919, 1920, 1921, 1922. And Andreas Malm says, this is what we need now. Mm. We need, we need to turn off the lights and everything for one hour a day, mm. you know, every day for, we need to, we need to have, a, you know, carbon limits for each of us, carbon for, you know, we need to be measuring everything and we need to have rationing basically. And I, a part of me thinks, yeah, that's right. We, we, we really do. And I, and I would. You know, I, as long as long as it's not imposed by an, an authoritarian regime, that that it also limits our artistic freedoms and our political freedoms, and our ability to assemble, to 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 riot, not riot. I don't mean to to march to demonstrate, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's it as long as it's imposed by by a government which I trusted, I would do that. You know, okay, I'm going to switch off the computer. I'm going to switch off all the electrics, everything mm. for one hour a day. I'd be fine with that. Mm. We could all do that. You know, I won't have a shower today. I won't have a, you know, I won't have a bath tomorrow. Mm. And I think we could all make a difference. But I, I just think this, these are the limitations of democracy, really, that, you know, a government is only going to do what it gets, going to get it elected, you know, mm. get it elected next time. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating throwing away democracy, but I am particularly in relation to the environment. I think we, we really do need very radical measures imposed or, and, and, and adhered to by government mm. with the best will in the world to make any difference at all. Mm. But I would say that that's, I mean, you know, you think of since the credit crunch, it's been like you move into austerity and then it's like, we all need to tighten our belts. We all need to tighten our belts. They don't need to tighten their belts. And then, oh, it's COVID. Oh, we all have to do this. We all have to, we'll all have to give up some of our freedoms. We have to give up our freedoms. They don't have to give up their freedoms. We're off to space, mate. Like, <laughs> so it's that thing of, you know, you, you're exhausting the will. And, and like with the electorates as well, I mean, you, you know, look at the way the electorates moved and, and what they're voting for. It's like, well, it looks like they want to give up democracy. I, th- I, think, we, I think that we need, I really, this is what makes me think it's just going to happen. But we, I, th- I think so many aspects of our society need root and branch mm. form, as in apt to tearing up and starting again. Mm. You, know, you look at transport, you look at uh, education, you just, we've got so many things wrong mm. and gradually things have just slipped. It's like watching something just slip out of focus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and out of alignment over a period of 30 or 40 years. And I just, we, we need, we need change in so many areas and they need to be, and it really needs to be radical in the, in the truest sense of it's a, it's at the root. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm a Republican. I don't believe in the monarchy. I think it's a, it's a symbol of everything that's wrong with this country. The recent Jubilee celebrations passed me by completely. I just, I can't understand it. I just think, why do we? Why do we worship, venerate these, this, this family of dull, but, you know, well-meaning people who, who inherit this, this mantle, which is, which is nobody would thank you for anyway. It's kind of a horrible thing to have, but why do we do it? What's it about? Uh, so it's on the, it's on the BBC, isn't it? <laughs> I don't get it, but I, but I do think we need to lose it because until we do, we're going to be enslaved by, by. All, all sorts of predilections that are 
of, of, which will make it impossible for, for us to de democratize and to equalize mm. and leveling up. It's a joke. Sorry, don't get me started, but it's that again, it's just a way of not talking about genuine inequality. Mm. I mean, I would say going back to sort of climate change and your work, I mean, your, your work is very much community based and like the stuff that you do with Chapel FM and the East Leeds stuff, I mean, locality is really, really important. You know, there's this sort of uh, going away, going abroad is very much exoticized, but you know, you miss the kind of history under your feet. It's like, I've, I've talked about this in the podcast before when, when you sort of, you taught history, you taught Kings and Queens and stuff and like, you know, a tiny portion of the map of the world and a couple of events here and there. And it's like, but we could learn all of this through what happened on this road? When was this road built? Why was it built? Who built it? What was going on at the time? Why was this, why was the city expanding out here? Like you can do all of that through something that's, that's, you know, specific and local and that, that people can track to. And I think promoting that, like, you know, like pride in place, I think that's really important. And I think it's really important in the climate movement as well, because, you know, Think of how many environmentalists are jumping on planes to fly across the world to talk about sustainability. It's like you've just put 24 tons of carbon in the sky. What are you talking about? <laughs> yes, I, I, I get that. And I think in terms of the local, I suppose that's very much, I mean, I, at the moment I'm doing, a, I've been working on a project again with this with Matthew Bellwood, this colleague of mine, he's a storyteller and a writer. He's been, he does a lot of local history stuff. He was working in Morallerton at uh, primary school in Morallerton. Now, you know, Morallerton for me is the ring road and it's, you know, it's just some, some houses on the other side, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's Sainsbury's. Mm. But what he's doing with that school, it, and I was documenting it and I've been editing the audio documenting. So I'm making a documentary about that. And I went to a lot of the sessions with the children. But there they were, you know, in the, in the library, looking at old maps. Some of those kids had never seen a map before. You know, mm. one, uh, one girl who was about nine, I interviewed, she said, oh, I've never seen a paper map. I've seen one on Google, my sister's, you know. And, but they were looking at old maps, looking at where, how much countryside there was. There's a farm there where the school was. They were making models out of, out of old junk of Argos, of, you know, of Sainsbury's, of okay, a local church, the school, they were they, so they were, they were looking at photographs of those things and making, you know, cardboard models of them. Mm. And it was really making them conscious of their environment. And, and what I suppose what they come out thinking is this isn't a boring area. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd be, I walk past that thing every day. I've never looked at it before. I've never looked at that building before. Mm. I've never really thought about the road being here. You know, it's, it, it's, and so they're, 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 their perception of their local area is completely transformed mm. by engagement with it. Through, in this case, through art and history, mm. through making, you know, and I, I, it was, it was very moving. And I think I'd like to think, yeah, I do. I do stuff. I I've been working on, I suppose it is about celebrating what you have in city. And I, I love Leeds. It's a great city. I was looking, I'm just at the moment, just driving around a bit, cycling around and walking to the pub the other night to meet a friend. It's so beautiful this time of year with the, the red brick, the black drain pipes, the, the, the green, so much green, mm. so, so many trees. And I, 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 I love that. I've been doing um, some work on sports in, in Leeds. It's a project called Unsung Sports, celebrating grassroots sports, so non-mainstream sports, and just those communities that attach to all those, Gaelic for the Irish community around Gaelic football. You know, um, the roller skating community, which is a really interesting community of, of all kinds of people, you know, but they're out in the parks, they're out mm. so high, you know, you, and, and they all, it's just a WhatsApp group. They, that's it. It's a kind of fantastic sort of anarchistic way of, of operating. They don't organize in any other way. They don't have a committee or anything. It's just like, <laughs> where are we? Oh, I'm at the park now. Do you want to come? Yeah. And it's, and, and I think there's something about there's something very hopeful about that for me, which is just about communities organizing in very informal ways and celebrating the fact that they're outside on wheels and that's what they have in common and celebration of physicality, of exercise, of, 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 of yeah, of being together, mm. small groups and doing a thing that they love. 
Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know how that ties in. It feels, it doesn't feel political when you talk about it, but I think it kind of is in a, in a way. Well, yeah, I mean, but if you think of what, what is the, what is the, what is the image they sell of the, the modern person? They're like, you know, what is the image they sell to the youth? It's like, you know, be cool, be trendy, be flash, be jet setting, like go here, be cultured, you know, be everything The you know, be a mom and be a career woman as well. Be a, like do everything all the time and be, have a fantastic body and, you know, have the energy to be like that all the time as well <laughs> and care about it. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I do think it's radical to just, you know, be a bit more, sit the sun down and, you know, just calm down and chill out and talk about what's happening nearby and what the weather's like. And and the value of that as well, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and there was one evening actually where I just had a real sense of, God, this is what a city's really about, actually. And it's not a, it's, as you say, this is what history is about, really. I, I was, I went down to the Corn Exchange on an evening to do the writing workshop with roller skaters, mm. as you do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was some January and, and I went down there. And when I was there with the road, some of the roller skaters were there practicing in the Corn Exchange. And there's a really lovely shop there as well called Roller Kilgay, where they sell stuff. I don't want to do the roller skating. But all the way around the Corn Exchange, there was the Leeds Sketching Club. I think they called the Leeds Sketching Club. And there were just people dotted around just drawing bits of the corn exchange inside, which is a wonderful building. And they, and they were mostly younger people. They were mostly sort of people in their twenties and thirties, not what you might expect of a kind of the lead sketching club, which you could, you might think, oh, it's probably established in 1873 and it's full of, you know, I don't know, a certain kind of person. Not at all. They were New blue rinse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, yeah. But they were, they were a real variety of people. I thought, and I went away really kind of feeling very cheered by that. I think these things happen in a very small way, unannounced. They have their, maybe they have their sort of their, their, their WhatsApp group or their Facebook page. Mm. They just get on with it. But that's the warp and weft of a, of a city. That's what a city is really about. It's this mm. people doing stuff, you know, in a very small ways. And it's about when you see that, it, I, I don't know, that gives me hope. I just think I feel part of that. And, mm. and belonging is such a big thing these days. I just think we, if you don't feel you belong anywhere, mm. then I think that's really difficult. I think, and that goes back to the COVID thing of what am I for? Who am I? Who are my people? What, what, who am I? You know, what, what's my purpose? What's my meaning? What can I do? It's not just what should I do? It's what can I do? It's like, oh, somebody should do something about that. But it's like, well, realistically, can I? And if I could, how would I? So it's it's about knowing what you, it's about knowing how to do things. And then about knowing like how many people it needs to do that thing. And then that, you know, there's a lot involved basically. And you need, you need to answer a lot of questions before a lot of activity can take place. I mean, even if you sort of, uh, and like an activist learner is like, I'm just going to go and do it. I have to do it. You still like the first thing you do when you just go and do it is you run into loads of problems and you go, okay, well, how do I deal with that problem? And how do I deal with that problem? So you've, you've always got questions to answer, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, so that was, see, that was quite an interesting diversion from just climate change. So we'll move on to, let's go down the social media route. So here I want to look at kind of how much time it takes up in terms of your work time, how much labor is social media for you and how much is the return on investment of that labor? Like, does it really reward or does it feel like it just takes up quite a lot of your time and you don't really get the benefit you want out of it? Hmm. I, I have to do a certain amount of it hmm. uh, and particularly certain projects that I do have demanded it. I'm just linking back to the song portraits. You know, I had to demonstrate that it wasn't just me in my room with my keyboard, put, you know, pissing about on, on, on garage, <laughs> but actually I was producing something that justified the expenditure of this, you know, this money that was mm. the short supply from Leeds Inspired. So I, you know, I put all the songs on SoundCloud individually when they, when I'd written them and, you know, people listened to them. I mean, and. 
that was that was gratifying and that was part of the job you know i had to do that i had you know that was part of what i was required to do but it was also i quite enjoyed it if i'm honest like i got slightly obsessed with ooh, a few people oh i'm up from you know like 158 listens to 161 terrible isn't it he's just watching watching the numbers and then they don't move and you're like why aren't the numbers moving yes, yes. <laughs> oh i must i'll have to refresh it and, I'll, I'll have, and it's the same but you know it's uh, i think i think it's I use Twitter. I'm, I'm, I don't use Instagram and I don't use Facebook much these days. So I, uh, I, I do, I do it when I'm required to do it. I think as part of my work, but mm. as part of being a self-employed artist, you have to tell people you're still there. Mm. Uh, you know, there are people who are very good at that and tell you they're there all the time, even though they're not doing very much with being there, but I do admire those people because I'm not one of those. My instinct is to lie low and go, okay, somebody will hear of it. And mm. if it's, if, if I've just done something with those people in that room and they've got something from it, that's enough. That's great. Mm. Um, which on one level is true, but I think at the same time, in order to keep, just to keep, uh, yeah, to keep in the picture and to be part of a cultural environment, which I feel I am in this city mm. and I like to be, you know, I, I do have to put stuff out there and say, oh, well, I'm still doing this thing or this thing's happening. Mm. Um, and it's not always about me. It could be about a program that I've done or, you know, that, that is being done, or has been done or something, a live event at Chapel of M or mm. something or somebody or a friend's done. But it's, I, I, I do think that's in, incumbent upon me to do and I have to do it, but yeah, I'm not, I'm, I don't particularly enjoy it. And to be quite honest with you, it doesn't take up a lot of my time. Mm. I, I mean, if I was going to say a day, maybe, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. Yeah. But you haven't had that kind of experience of you posted a thing and it went massive and all of a sudden you've got like loads more customers and exposure and like, you know, a new, new level of wealth and prosperity from, you know, sending out tweets or whatever. <laughs> Well, the other day, actually, quite interesting. I, I put, I put, I load up all my Love the Words podcasts. So it's a weekly mm. podcast I do on Captivate, and you know, I check to see what's happening. And suddenly, suddenly, it was like it, my my the listenership or the had gone up sort of like by seventeen thousand percent or somewhere. Wow. I think I think it was actually it must have been some numerical. I can't believe. Yeah. And then, of course, it all disappears again. I don't know what had happened, and I don't understand it. So, so I, somebody had retweeted it, and then it all gone. Bit, and then, then it goes back to what it is. But uh, no, not really. I, I, I've never had that experience of a, a viral explosion of anything I've done, and so I've been quite quiet. You know? mm. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the time, I think you know, people do these kind of outrageous things. I think sometimes just because they want you know you that like because they're trying to get the the noise they're trying to be hers so they say something that like they get more and more ridiculous and then it's like oh now i'm famous for that thing so <laughs> like oh this is what you wanted now you've got it but you've got it for the wrong reason so done social media done climate change done brexit uh you be if you had a universal basic income, so you had like a stipend being given to you every month, which gave you enough to kind of live, gave you a basic standard of living, you can throw universal basic services into your answer if you want as well. But basically, if you had a universal basic income, would you still work? Would you still be doing what you're doing? And would you still do it as much or would you do more? Like, how would it change things for you? I don't think it would change anything. I, 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 I suppose I'd. I, I really, I enjoy most of us, most of the aspects of what I do. I would write anyway. Some, I know some writers who don't write unless they're paid, but on commission mm -hmm. to do, to do that thing. That's, that's, that's what they do. And that's, that's fine. I, I will always write anyway. Because, I mean, as I was saying to you before, at the moment, I'm feeling slightly jittery because I have spent a lot of time with people. I haven't had very much time on my own, or I haven't given myself that time. I could make that time and I haven't. Uh, I do need to get down to some writing. I've got lots of ideas for poetry that I need to, to develop. I want to develop, but I also need to do it. And I, and I will feel happy when I've done it because I, I love the engagement with just, you know, messing about with words and making some, something. Um, and I, so I, I, I will always do that part of the work. There's, there's, there are parts of the work that I do that I might choose not to do. I, I'm, I'm very 
I'm a, I'm a kind of at base. I'm a, I'm a, not a loner, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a solitude person, I, I think, although I have a tension there, as I've, I've explained, you know, I, I love to be with people too, but I, uh, I, I got into writing because I like being on my own a lot. It's a bit ironic that I do so much time with other, so much, I'm, I'm so much with other people doing writing collaboratively, but every group I go to makes me nervous. Yeah, you know, every time I've been running groups with young people, or with children for years, but you know, the night before I go into a new group, say I've got to go to a school, I don't know those kids. I, you know, the night before I won't sleep very well. I'll be mm. thinking about it. I'll need to be really prepared. So I think it's something about a residual thing that any, any group situation produces a certain amount of anxiety in me, sometimes not extreme, but uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and that doesn't go away really annoyingly. I mean, I'm, you know, some things don't go away as you get older. I still blush, which really pisses me off. I would have thought that might have gone by now. Uh, <laughs> but also, I do have this still, I do still have this kind of, oh, God, I was only a group of people. And then I get in front of this group of like eight year olds. Mm. And I think, oh, oh my, where do I get, <laughs> what do I at least sleep about that for? Uh, 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 so it's a weird thing. I think I might probably, if I wasn't paid to do that, if I had only a universal income or if I wasn't the, the absolute, if I didn't have to do that, I might not do so much of that, or I might not do very much of it at all. I don't know. And then I might go, oh, I really miss that because I'm yeah. a kind of contradictory person. But b- broadly speaking, uh, I think I would, I would carry on what I'm doing and, you know, I have to anyway, because I don't have a, you know, I've got, a, you know, I'll just, I'll be on, I've got a state pension and I'm coming and that's about it. <laughs> like a lot of artists, we're not pensioned up. So I'm going to have to keep on working Simon until I'm very old. <laughs> I think we all are now. Um, <laughs> by the time, you know, I get anywhere near retirement age, it'll probably be 150. So yeah, yeah. I think I was going to come back to something then, but I'm going to move on with the next question. If you could change any three things about your work, what would they be? You've got basically carte blanche for this. So what would you change? Change about, do you mean about the way I work? It could be about the way you work, the sort of work that you're doing, the amount of work you have to do. I mean, any, any way that you want to interpret it really. I think probably to go back to that theme again, I would, I would have more, I would put aside more time or I would find a way of making more time to write on my own and write in a concentrated way on one, you know, and do one thing for a Mm -hmm. period of time rather than hop and skip about between stuff. I think, uh, I'd like to do more theater at the moment. I, 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 I wrote a play a few years ago called Sandhouse, which was done for a couple of weeks, or was it a week in the studio of, of, of cast in Doncaster. It was a play, it was a local piece about a fantastic story of, of a man who built a house out of sand mm-hmm. in the Victorian period in Donny and, uh, I researched it there and the play was done there. It was a very satisfying thing. It was, it was cause people, a lot of people it sold out when it was, it was on there. And then we were due to do it again and then COVID happened. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really hope to do that again. I miss, I do miss working in theater with actors and with the director. And I'd love to do a bit more of that. I love working collaboratively with people. I work with photographer. I work a lot with composers mm-hmm. and I. Uh, I'd love to do. Okay. Here's another one. Recently I did, I did something that was for me very brave, which was cause I'm, I have wanted to do it for years and I had an opportunity. So I did it. It was to do a physical piece of physical theater that was just me, no words at all, mm. apart from on a tape. And I had, tw- I had a 20 minute slot and in somebody else's show. And I thought, well, right, I'm going to have to do this cause I, if I don't do it now, I never will. I nearly bottled it. I, and I thought, now I could do it. I could breathe some power in, that's fine. But I rehearsed it on my own, didn't show it to anybody else. And eventually, and I, and I did it in front of an audience. And I love dance. And I, 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 I wouldn't call that dance, but I would call it moving about in space mm. without words. But I'd love to do some more of that. And I've been, I collaborated with a very lovely chap called Anthony Haddon, the director, on previous sort of almost pieces that were similar to, to, to that. I have, I'd love to do some more of that. I have to, I have many projects on my books on the floor for these various projects that I want to write 
I'd love to have more time to develop those and more opportunities to collaborate with people. But, you know, there's probably, even if I was doing that, I'd probably want to do more of it because I just, I do, you know, I love developing new projects and I, and I love research. I'd like to do some more research. I love the idea. I worked at the armories for a while as a writer in residence at the Royal Armories, which is a weird place. It's like, a, somebody said it's like a big boy's bedroom with lots of, you know, guns on the walls and you know, things to do mischief to people with. But, you know, I, 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 there was a library there. I did, I had a whole, somebody one day just came in with a box of letters from the first world war and said, these have just arrived. They were found in a the garage. They smelt three or so the letters hadn't been opened for since 1919 when this chap died and, and they, you know, here you go. Can you do something with that? And I had probably three weeks just to sit and just go through, read these letters. And they were so uh, very, very moving us between a man and a woman from Doncaster, actually, um, in the First World War. And I love that sort of research of just being with this staff, you know, and then making something of it. I suppose the, cru the crucial question for me, the crucial yeah, thing is what you make of it, what you make of it. I just, I, I love the idea of making something from it. Okay. Whether it's despair or hope or a load of letters or a, you know, this sort of plastic bottle. What, what, what do you make of it? What, what, what does it mean to you? What does it say to you? Write something, paint something, say something. And as, as long as I've got that question in my head, I'll keep going. And, and as long as I have time to do it, I'll, I want to do more of it. So have you any others that you can think of in terms of change or? Um, in terms of changing, I just want, it sounds like I just want more of everything, isn't mm. it? Uh, so I want more energy, Simon. Yeah, I'd like to change that. I'd like more time, man. More time, more energy, more resources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, fat, fat, I hope of getting you more money. Forget that. But it's, the other stuff I would like more of. So that's the, that, that's the only change. Those are the only changes I would, I would like um, to, to, yeah, to do really. Yeah. So I want to like just kind of briefly dip into... So the idea of, well, two things. So the idea of, do you know David Graeber, the anthropologist? Oh, I, I, know, I know the name, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah, him. he wrote the book Debt, uh, 5,000 5, Years of the History of Debt. And then he wrote another book called uh, Bullshit Jobs, which is very good, uh, looking at the amount of people who do work where they hate their job and they're kind of ashamed of it, even though they're sort of all right paid and... Like by the sounds of it sound okay, but the people doing it know that it's completely meaningless and needless uh, and, and they don't like that. So he talks about, you know, the, the concentration in talking about work and the economy on production. It's like, why is there all this obsession with production? Like you produce something once, you know, you make a cup once, you wash it a thousand times. So like most work is maintenance rather than production. So there's that idea. And then the other idea I want you to kind of think about is in terms of you and your work, when you're producing something, and we touched upon that idea of control, like making something yourself, it's like the kind of, so the image I've got in my head is like making something all on your own. And then you go, I've made this thing that I've obsessed about. And then you just go and drag loads of people over and go, look at the thing that I've made, like, buy it off me. <laughs> like, so just there, if I could get you to talk around those ideas, but I think it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it, that drives to the heart of a big question, which is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of art, a piece of art. If nobody reads it, sees it, mm. listens to it, is it enough to produce something, put it on a shelf, put it, or even, you know, tear it up, put it in the bin in terms of me. I tend to want to share it. I think, mm. I think I tend to need to share it, but I d that doesn't have to be with a load of people. And I think I, a lot of the people I work with and I maybe help them to write a poem, they might never have written a poem before. They might show it to one other person. They might show it to their mum. They might show it to their best friend. It might say something to them about what they're going through at that particular moment or something they've seen noticed and they share it with somebody else and that's enough. That's all they need to do. And I think that's totally fine. I think we're in a culture where we seem to be obsessed with the idea of, you know, it goes back to social media, how many 
likes do I have? How many people will like this thing, love this thing? You know, it's, it's like, mommy, I've done this turd, you know, coming over. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very primitive thing, you know, kind of, that, 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 no, 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 no. And I think, yeah. but I think you, <laughs> it, it can just be mommy. It doesn't have to be. Uh, you know, like <laughs> the whole village, the whole village, or the whole world. It's fine. You know, and I think that it, for me, it can be very satisfying. Just the, the main thing is the doing and the sharing. As long as that person who you share that with and show it to understands that. And I mean, understand, I think understand is a great word. It's in the sense of being, I'm getting underneath something mm. and saying, yeah, you know, mm. just holding you and holding you in a way, listening really seeing what you've done. If it's somebody who goes, yeah, lovely. That's, I don't think that counts. If somebody goes, I really, I looked at that and I don't really understand it, but yeah, I see what you're doing or you're trying to do. Mm. Then, then somebody's getting underneath that. They're, mm. they're, they're holding the weight of it, you know, and that, I think that's so, I think there's an awful sort of hunger for that. I think there are, I think loneliness is something about not having that. You know, mm. nobody really looking carefully at what you've produced, what you've done, what you've got, or even or saying, please do that. Don't get yeah. inside. A lot of this, we have so many voices in our heads going, nah, that, I'll be shit at that. Don't do it. You know, I worked with some prisoners once on a, on a single, we made a single in prison. It was an, you know, it was a big thing to do to have a recording engineer come in. We got money to do it. It was a prison band. It was wonderful. You know, the, the, the single was great. And I played it to them for the first time after the, you know, the producer had done it, he'd done, done a mix of it and they went, nah, it's shit, mm. it's shit. And it's just because they were preempting somebody else saying it was going to be shit. So they were going to say it's shit first. So I think there's so many voices in our head saying we can't do something and that this doesn't count. But when you actually, when you, when somebody does something, makes something, shares it with somebody else and they go and you, and he's seen and he's heard. That's a wonderful thing. That's, that's, that's not a cure for loneliness, but it's something that will slightly diminish, you know, diminish the loneliness perhaps where the many of us often feel mm. a lot of people do feel in a chronic way too. I think it's interesting as well. You know, you were talking about sort of, I mean, you, 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 just, you clearly see yourself and you are a writer, but like how you touched on so many different mediums as well you know like working on the radio working in theater doing different pieces of performative work and doing different styles of work doing poetry and and what you're saying there in terms of someone trying to understand a piece of work I think very much you're always trying to communicate something especially when you're working in any medium and that choice of medium also is very that's about what you're trying to communicate as well it's about who you're trying to speak to i think that's yeah i think that's true <laughs> for one of a better expression yeah so i want to give you a bit of space now if you want to bring anything up talk about anything that we've not touched upon yet i think i've gone through all of my questions we could do i've got a question on unions and a question on drugs that i'm trying to formulate i haven't quite got to yet so we could look at those if you want to but we don't have to so what would you like to do? Well, I, I, I probably, you know, I probably anything I say about unions or drugs is, is going to be fairly predictable. So I, th I, I mean, I'd, I'd keep those for somebody who's probably got more, yeah, more, is more thought through about them. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, now how do you feel about sort of drugs and work? I mean, and I'm using this obviously in my very broad sense. So I include caffeine, alcohol, yep. and I've touched upon like, you know how integral the pub used to be to work okay. um and even within my working career like i remember you know mm -hmm. plenty of times going to the pub at lunchtime and so on and it wasn't frowned upon it wasn't like everywhere you go like you smell of alcohol you must leave so i think that i think that's interesting i think it's at like how we engage with that in terms of work so but i haven't quite got to a question on it yet but yeah i mean is there anything that you you want to throw in there about like, I mean, do you have to, do you run on coffee or <laughs> do you need to have a glass of wine in the evening? Like how, how does it affect things? Do you think? I think, I think food and drink for me are about, about rhythm mm. in the day. I, I work best in the morning. I'm not somebody who 
works all night. Though sometimes I think it's really useful to, 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 to push yourself out of those, off those tram lines. You know, I keep on saying to myself, I'm one night, one day I'm going to actually just, yeah, I'm just going to work all night. See what happens. It might produce a different kind of writing in me. But I do like to work in the morning when I'm clear headed and I need to have a few cups of tea in order to do that. Mm. I need to have a cup of coffee, you know, sometime in the morning. I, I, during lockdown, I think I probably drank too much. I think a lot of us did because there was something about separating the day, yeah. from the evening, um, and a glass of wine, you know, doing that suddenly. If I, I mean, I'm, t- I'm very pathetic when it comes to alcohol, Simon, in the sense, <laughs> you know, my body only has to have a whiff of, of yeah. alcohol and it goes, yeah, okay, give up now, stop working. I'm done to think about anything else. So, I, I mean, I, I know that if I have a drink at the wrong time of day, that's work gone for yeah. me. And I can't even read very well. I don't take in words. And so I, I have to keep off alcohol if I want to, to work or read. So I'm quite strict about that, actually. I'm not. You know, Dylan Thomas, I think it helped him to write some fantastic poetry when he was, you know, 19 and a half, you know, a few pints, but I, not me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm probably very boring on, on, on the question of drugs and work, but any kind of drugs, but I, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, it's often, often about separation of work periods for me. And I, and I, and I work in bursts and I, th- I actually think that for me, I can do maybe four hours good originating a day as in write raw writing i can do that i can't do more than that i can do it in the morning mm. my ideal would be to go off and you know surf a cycle ride or you know or, you know if i was by the sea have a have a swim or a walk come yeah. back and do some revision at sort of five six seven o'clock in the evening redrafting stuff and then get up in the morning nice and nice and early and do four more hours sort of it's, i i just don't i know now that that's all i can do and I've always, I've always, and it's not something I've, it's changed. I've, it's always been away from me. Yeah. So, it, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's about structuring time and, and for, for the best, best, the best possible productivity, if you mm. like, in terms mm. of, of work for me mm. and, and food and drink kind of punctuate, punctuate those patterns. Mm. I mean, like we've, uh, before on here we've talked about sort of you know covering work-life balance and well-being and things like that and we've touched upon working from home before and that kind of transition to working from home and obviously the separation between work and life and as you know maybe there is no separation ultimately but like so I mean you do still work around but when you first sort of being a writer and you know like we again we've touched upon this earlier the the sort of the things that you want to do need to do have to make yourself do and you know that you're going to do it and like you said I know I'll enjoy it when I'm doing it once I get going and I know I'll enjoy it when I've done it because it's like I've done that I feel better yeah like finding out so for me coming into this like finding out how I wanted to work and how I like to work because you don't you don't get that opportunity work doesn't give you that opportunity it says you start here you finish there we give you this shut up go home <laughs> like so doing that like finding for yourself how you work what what motivates you what makes you work less what time of day you're most productive like how long are you productive for all of those things they're like tremendously variable and then trying to get all of us to slot into a kind of nine to five go get on the bus come back on you know, however, going to work, do the hours, come back. I don't want to say damaging, but I think it's like, it's, it's a strange experience. And that makes it very difficult coming out of that to deprogram yourself. Like, how did you find, did it just naturally evolve into a working process for you of like, it just happened? Or was it quite difficult to kind of identify the things that motivated you and like, I mean, do you feel like you've really slotted into that now? Like, are you have you been doing this long enough where you're like, this is my job, this is my career, this is my work, I know what I'm doing, I know how to do it. Like, have you mastered it or is there any kind of lingering imposter syndrome? Or I'm asking a bunch of questions here. <laughs> but I think you know what I'm driving at. Yes, I do. I don't have imposter syndrome anymore, actually. I don't have that because I part of me, I just think, you know, I haven't got time to 
Which I've been is, doing it too long. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, and I'm not knocking off either. So, <laughs> uh, but I think in terms of, of development over the years, I think I'm a late developer. I think in everything I have come, I've just been a bit late. So and I think when I was in my twenties, I, I knew that I wanted to do this thing, but I didn't really have the confidence to go, I want to do that thing. So I had to be kind of, it was a combination of accidental mm. plus really important things that mentors who don't even know their mentors and some of them I'm not even in touch with anymore. Mm. They said to me that nudged me to do something. People, you know, serendipitous meetings with people are sort of falling into things. I mean, the word career always amuses me because it's, you know, it's supposed to be this, be my career. And it's, it implies this kind of, this very planned structured mm. sort of edifice. In fact, for me, it's careering about, you know, it's much more the <laughs> yeah. way uh, between different things. And it's almost a sort of a mixture of control and accident. So I, and I've always been, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm running out of life now, uh, but, but I'm, and I'm really frustrated about that. I'm thinking, shit, cause if I'm a late developer, I've still got things I want to do in 10 years time yeah, I yeah. Should be doing now that I'll yeah. get around to get going and around to doing, and it'll be too late then I'll be doddery. So I, I, but that's just the way I am. And I think some people don't find that at all. They, I think I, I, an interesting thing when I was, I've been working with ELFM, East Leeds FM and with chapter. Them, as I said, for I've been working with them for about 12 years. And about I, I st when we started doing this work, I, these young people were coming forward to sing their songs. You know, they would we would record them. They had no compunction about it. It was something about that thing about youth. Here I am, I've got my guitar. This is my song. I'm going to play it on the radio. And some really lovely things happening in the Leeds music scene around there in 2010, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. um, and that really inspired me. Well, it, it sort of shoved me. At my, you know, I was well into middle age by then, but it was that thing of, well, if they can do that, mm. I, can, I, I can do that. I've been writing songs for years mm. and actually I'd never really done that much with them. And if I'd played them in the band I was with, it was kind of, somebody went, mm, not sure about that. I go, okay then. Yeah. But I thought after seeing these young people do that, I thought, right, come on, you know, and, and I started, I sort of came out really as a songwriter and got to collaborate with different people, formed a couple of bands made a few albums and you know that's led on to all sorts of different things including the sunshine sports piece just now piece of work you know and it, it's a and that again was a sort of a weird I, I i i kind of wish i had been or i was the sort of person who was much more assertive and knew exactly what they wanted to do any particular and then acted on it yeah. rather than going oh maybe someone will you know maybe that maybe this but that's just not me. You know, I don't have that kind of sort of rock solid confidence. So I don't have imposter syndrome, but I still, I still fret a lot about mm -hmm. whether I bring off a project, make it work, make it happen or not, whether I have the wherewithal or the, the gumption, the organization to do it. So I still have worries and anxieties all the time, as I say, even back going to a new group of eight year olds, mm -hmm. but I kind of have more of a faith that it will work out and I'll be able to do it just because I've done it before, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that answers any of the speech. <laughs> no, it does. I mean, uh, like I, I definitely brought up some interesting things. So that, that, that's the thing. That's what else did I want to cover anything else? Well, I've got you. I mean, do, uh, do you want to, oh, we haven't done the round a 150 years thing. So we could talk about that briefly. Has that happened already or is the, is that, to you soon well something's quite interesting that happened has happened over the last few years for me in terms of work is that i i'm originating more of my own more projects myself i mm -hmm. uh, just that's something that's a kind of confidence that has grown like the dortmund project mm -hmm. so that's an example like i'm sung sports you know these are ideas i had and i got together with collaborators and they helped me you know we worked together to put in an application to the arts council or something somewhere else and like some portrait. <clears throat> so I had, I, I just, I, I feel very proud. I suppose. Why should I feel proud? I, 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 
I think we should all feel very happy and proud about the public spaces we have in the city because I think mm-hmm. the green spaces in Leeds are extraordinary. Yeah. You know, in places like Round Hay Park and Round Hay Park was a real story because I went going into too much detail. You know, the mayor at the time had the idea of buying this land for the people of Leeds. It was a mistake outside the city on some hills surrounded by other estates, <clears throat> which were owned by merchants and landowners who resisted this idea of the purchase of this land for the people, the working people of Leeds. But this guy, this mayor, he was a bit of a hero, really. He, he, he even mortgaged his own house, remortgaged his own house to make this happen. And in a public auction, he raised the right amount of money against, in the teeth of opposition of these local landowners who went, no, if we can pipe a come up from Leeds to, on the weekend, they'll be able to look over the fence into my estate. You know, and these were all hunting originally sort of this was hunting land it goes back to the king john you know mm. so I, mean, and I think that's another thing i think the land and the ownership of land in this country is a scandal we so, so few people still own so much land but that was a real struggle to and, and, and the, there was a demonstration of something like sixty thousand people mm. from leeds up to Rante in support of the purchase of the park and that kind of swell of public sort of demand influenced the parliamentary inquiry into it. And the, mon- the, the money was raised, that land was bought, and we have Randy Park. Mm. You know, and that's an extraordinary story. And I mm. think, you know, I've, it's due to people like James Barron, but also all sorts of other people, all those people who marched for that land, mm. that have all these public spaces, Mewood Park, the Hollies, you know, Middleton Park, fantastic, you know, place, all these big green spaces. So I wanted to do a project that celebrates that. Mm. And and so I got together with um, some some other artists and we have some money from the Arts Council Heritage Lottery to do a celebration in the park, in Roundhead Park, collaborating with the friends of Roundhead Park over the summer. So that's uh, something you look forward to. And I'm, and I'm really enjoying delving into the history and finding out, yeah, kind of, and also, yeah, we're working with local schools. We're working with Interior House, which is a residential centre in, um, they centre, residential centre worth in, in Round Tape. Oh, yeah, we're doing, working with the community to produce this, mm. this, this piece of work. So, yeah, looking forward to that. But also, I just, I would put in a word for something else that I think ties into a lot of the questions you've been asking to do with where we are in terms of, being on our own, being in communities, how we interact, what we can do uh, to change things. And something that we're doing at Chapel FM is a project called Home From Home. We're we're talking to people about, in our community, about those social spaces that can be transformative transformative for people, for young people, for for, for older people, for any people of any age. Like the Kentmere Community Centre, for instance, in Seacroft, which was almost derelict a few years ago, but it's been taken over by um, a mixture of voluntary and voluntary agencies, also Lisa Council initiatives. And it's now a really flourishing pay- place where people come to do all sorts of things, you know, and that's a fantastic example of a place where people belong. They feel, they get together, they feel like they're at home. They're not at home, they're not at work, they're in a, they're in a place that's between but it is a social space. So many of those we've lost, youth centres, you know, youth clubs, where at the moment with the Unsung Sports Project, it became really clear that there is a real shortage of, of, of spaces that people can hire to do those sports. Masses of money for football, forget that, you know, cricket, rugby. But if you want to play table tennis on a Monday night, it's expensive mm. because that leisure centre costs £100 for that mm. room to rent, mm. you know, for a Monday night. And that's, that's scandalous. You know, that's ridiculous. If we, if we, if those, those places are, and those things, those activities are really important for people, ordinary people, local people in this, in this city, we need to make it easy for them to do it. But, you know, we need to, so we need to celebrate those, those, those social spaces, which aren't online necessarily that, you know, we can be online, we can be on our computers, but getting together in places art centres, sports centres, churches, pubs, as you've mentioned, you know, the amount of pubs that have disappeared. It's like, you know, it, we, we need to really protect the ones that are, celebrate the ones that in the past that might have gone, 
I mean, and remember them, but also plan for future social spaces. So that's an oral history project we're doing in East Leeds at the moment called Home From Home. And anybody, this is, if anybody's listening to this, wants to get involved, just, you know, get, come to Chapel FM, we'll give us a ring and you can get involved in gathering people's stories. Or if you have a story related to a particular place that is important to you, mm. then come and talk to us. Mm. I think that's a really awesome idea. So, you know, I mean, part of the reason that I want to do this is capture, you know, yeah, I think about, because obviously it's not a topical show. I mean, we're touching on, you know, some, some media kind of areas, but it's about seeing what people are doing, you know, it's about as much. And, and I think this is a really important time. And, you know, I thought that before we hit COVID and then I was like, oh God, if we, if we started like this already, we're in for a ride, aren't we? Oh so, yeah, I, I think that's a really good project. So yes, I would encourage anyone who is listening to this, who can get involved, get involved in that. Right. I don't think I have anything else particular. I could probably get us talking on something else and could probably get you saying plenty more. And I could probably throw in a lot more stuff as well, but like. I don't want to keep you too long. Well, if there's anything else, go for it. I probably need to go in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but I've probably got, you know, anything else, Simon, that you want. This, this is good. I mean, I, I, th I really applaud the fact that you're going for big, you know, big questions to do with the things that matter to us at the time, at the now, because I think we are in a very important time. So, you know, I, I think that's, a, I, I, you know, I don't see that around a lot. Sometimes asking those big questions can seem daunting for people. On the other end but actually they often elicit the kind of what you could think is that you know you've been thinking but haven't expressed before so good on you yeah well i mean as well with people like asking people you know like so much and and i hear this as well i mean like it's going to be no secret to anyone who's listened to the shows that i'm a bit of a lefty but like so the sort of stuff that i listen to in so many times it's just here's this academic or this expert nothing wrong with academics or experts i have lots of time for them but it's, it's always talking about people, like talk to people, ask people what they think, you know, and, and not just what you think in a Vox Pop thing. I think you need to be able to contextualize it for people, because if, if we're asked our opinion, we're trying to, you know, we are, for want of a better expression, kind of virtue signaling with opinion, aren't we? we? We're kind of like, this is my group. This is how I identify. This is like what I think. And these are what I think are the things that. I think should be being said. But whereas if you put it in a context of work, people are thinking, well, how has that affected my work? And they're answering kind of more honestly. And you spend more time at work and you do more kind of social construction in work than you do from shopping or, you know, watching TV. I mean, obviously that's those consumption ha habits are important. But yeah, I think get people to think about it in their work context, especially something like Brexit. It's like, if you're really, really pro Brexit and then you're like, well, actually it's made things worse. You kind of have to confront those ideas. And equally, if you're like, I full on remain and then Brexit is like, well, it hasn't really made a difference to me. So, I, you know, so I think that's, that's interesting. And I've, I've hopefully tried to make the questions so that I'm, I'm kind of priming people to think about certain areas before. So to kind of widen it up. Uh, what I want basically is at the end of it for people to kind of go, I've never thought about it like that before. So that's what I'm Yes. And I think, uh, you know, I think sometimes it's very, I don't think we talk enough to people outside our box. I mean, this is a, this is a sort of trope at the moment. We tend to, to talk to people, but we're talking together. We broadly share the same values, but recent, about, about a year ago, or two years ago, during lockdown, actually just after one of the. Uh, we had Tory councillor come in from a local Tory councillor to come in and work and to do some, an interview, I think. And I had a kind of chat with him afterwards. It was fascinating. You know, I mean, he, he, he well, I mean, it, it was really, really interesting to, to, to actually talk to somebody who had very different values. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous to say, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of obvious that it would be, but part of me would walk away if I walk the other way, uh, rather than, rather than talk to him because he's a Tory, I mean, but actually he was a, an interesting guy. I mean, we disagreed of course, but soon we got on to Brexit, everything came to the law bridge came down, but yeah. And, and also was something else that occurs to me in terms of tackling the big things. I was once working for, uh, with as a writer in residence with an organization called father figures in, 
in Sheffield, which was an, an organization that was funded by NACRO, which is the, uh, the, organ, the, the charity that kind of supports prisoners when they've come out of prison. And then this was a project that was supporting the fathers of children who had been perhaps uh, were under, you know, the, perhaps had been in trouble with the law. Anyway, we, we, there were, there was a group of us, a team at, at, and Ben Yeager, who was the chap in charge at, at the time, he was the, he was the person who founded it. We went through a, a short phase. It was probably about a month where at every team meeting, we, we sat down, we sat down and he said, okay, so what do we just going to talk 15, 20 minutes now about something that isn't related to work? What do we think of, for instance, abortion? Whoa. <laughs> and you know, it was really really revealing and interesting because yeah. of course as a team we had different we had different views and then after 20 minutes fine it's gone on with the day mm. but it was like we were set in a kind of churn mm. immediately and not in a not a destructive or a, a, a in, in any way that kind of sort of because it became part of the day mm. it was a natural thing to to discuss with people who had to completely just dis- different views to you a really important subject mm. it wasn't like a big thing it was something that happened in that team meeting you know once a week and so and we didn't fall out about it we just disagreed and it mm. because it became a routine it was part of the wef- it, part of the texture of the day yeah mm. so and I, I really remembered that it's funny just think talking to you now it came back to my mind and oh, i think i should be more of that simon yeah i like that that's very interesting i think it is interesting how you know the way that people do talk i mean i i get you've worked abroad haven't you yeah yeah so i mean i think i find it interesting how different cultures work in different ways and the sort of subtle differences between them but yeah i think we should like it's always puzzled me why people don't talk more politics or where it's kind of out of favor and i think a lot of it is but it's like anything else it's like a muscle you know it's it, it's like democracy when we were having all those votes i fucking loved it i loved having that like 2016 vote and then the 2017 election and then like you know it was 2015 election 2016 brexit 2017 election it was like this is great we're being asked stuff and we're engaged and like there's stuff going on but i think it's like democracy is like anything else you have to practice it and it's not just putting an x in a box and it's the same with debate with politics it's like you have to practice it we can't just all get mad about something every few minutes because the murdoch papers told us to get mad about it and we all say this in the pub to each other and then we go home and we talk about football or whatever else. It's like that. We have to be active, be engaged. Quite right. And I think, yeah, and as you say, if it's something we do habitually mm. rather than in a setup debate where, where we, where the stakes are very high, mm. then I think it, it, it becomes that, that's, a, that's, that's democracy really. Yeah. That yeah. Is, that is democracy. Yeah, it's, it's doing democracy rather than playing democracy, because like you say, when you have those moments of just, OK, now do it, do be democracy now, be, be Dope McGregor, like do politics. Yeah. It's like, oh, quick, do politics. Ah, I don't know how to do it. I'm really angry and I'm stressed out now. <laughs> I'll just make it happen and stop and go away. But yeah, if, it's, if you're doing it all the time, it's like it's just another thing that you have to do. It's like like anything, it's like. Who wants to clean up poo and sick? You know, nobody. But parents just have to do it. You know, <laughs> it's like absolutely. I mean, I, my 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 son in in his sixth form, he got very much into the debate the debating society. Yeah, you know, and he absolutely loved it. Mm. You know, and he, he wasn't he wasn't somebody necessarily who would who would do that. But he got drawn into I don't know. But anyway, he 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 became actually very good at it as well. Mm. But and the standard was very high in the in that particular sixth form. But what was really interesting about it, of course, with, you know, when you do debating as a kind of activity, as a sort of sport, is that you often have to advocate for ideas that you don't necessarily believe in. Mm. So that's a really good exercise. You get underneath the skin of a completely different way of looking at things mm. to your own. And that's not, that's not, that's no shame. That's not a bad thing. I mean, because it, I think, you know, in order to understand how somebody with an opposite view to you really feels about things. You kind of have to enter into their mindset. There's something on radio that has been a really good program where two people, I can't remember what it's called, but I don't know if you've heard it, two people of completely different, well, I believe in Brexit, I, you know, mm-hmm. stay, remain, remain, leave, whatever. And they, they argue and there's a mediator. Mm-hmm. And one of the exercises they have to do is to argue from the point of view of the other person 
Mm. And usually by the end, there's some, not a kind of, oh, we're both really nice, aren't we? <laughs> but at the same time, there is a sort of accommodation of somebody's uh, opposition, you know, mm. and, and some sort of understanding of why, of where they're coming from and why they believe that. And that it's, it's, it's rather a lovely setup actually in that program. And it, I think, and it says a lot about the kind of what we need to do. Yeah. We need, we need to, uh, to enter into a, a real debate. We need to try and understand how other people feel, however hard that is, you know, and I think that's the future. Otherwise we'll, we'll end up killing each other. Thank you again to Peter for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener. You can go and find out about The Sandhouse at www.thesandhouse.org.uk. Come back on Friday to hear me talk to Anna Bland from Leeds Sanctuary. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leeds. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leeds to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released, to DM me with your questions, or most importantly, to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Please do chuck in anything you can to help the show grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for a pound a month or you can make a one-off donation of whatever amount. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours, again, from as little as a pound a month. Why not be super awesome and join both? Do something new and something different. Remember to like, share, follow, and subscribe to Working Hours. That's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leads. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited, and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Please like Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Leads, are you considering taking the plunge into podcasts or audio content? Then think Western Studios for support, advice and guidance on getting it made. At Western Studios, you work with a real life learner who is actually in Leeds. Not a piece of software, not a course of articles or a series of live chats and video courses, but me, a person in physical place-based reality. If you want to work with me to make your podcast or any digital audio content in Leeds, whether it's for your own cause, your publicity campaigns, to promote your products, increase your sales, or just to create your own passion projects, then get in touch with me, Western Studios, now. Don't wade through vapid articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts by disembodied virtual people on the web. Get on with making your podcast now, and then when it gets hard and expensive and it all goes wrong, which it will, then call Western Studios to make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios will take on your podcast boring, time-consuming and painful admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about your podcasting pain points and I can make it all better for you. I feel your pain. For a charge, I will share it. Remember, podcast work is work. Leeds businesses, Leeds campaigns, Leeds brands. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start? Contact Western Studios at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast straight away. The first hour of arranged consultation and pre-production time is free. £25 an hour after that for editing, recording, production. I can also arrange hefty discounts for the right projects. So tell me your idea and your budget and I'll tell you what I can do for you. What do you have to lose? Time, that's what. Time is running out. The best time to make a podcast was 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. Writers in Yorkshire, what are you doing with your lives? Hopefully you're writing. Well, I know there are listeners out there who want to hear great original writing performed as audio content that is about and for and has been made in Leeds. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them loiners what wants it. Help me make your old screenplays, unpublished novels, unperformed plays, stories, poems and performances, whatever you got baby, and make it as podcast content. Is your work arty, salacious, pulpy, strange, good? Is it unfinished, 
Good. I can help you with that too. I can work with you to find actors, musicians and voiceover artists and quickly realise your projects. I get practice making the shows and you get a finished, performed and published version of your writing. Save yourself the hassle and the headache of making your podcasts on your own by working with me instead.